This episode of the Astro Powder Podcast is brought to you by Gamma. Gamma's Optiflex Pro Manual Gun uses Power Boost technology, which gives you the industry's highest charging power at 110 volts and 110 microamps, allowing for faster and more efficient powder coating. We're handing you more power, more quality, and more control. For a demonstration, call 877 437 6771. That's 877 437 67 71. And be sure to mention, Ask Joe sent me. When you want to know that everything is covered, complete it with Gamma. <laughs> Hey, all you powder coating fans. Welcome to the third edition of Ask Joe Powder Podcast. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate your support. I'm your host, Joe Powder, a.k.a. Kevin Miller. And with me is my esteemed colleague and sidekick, Nathan. He's our powder coating formulator dude. Hello. And we're broadcasting from the PCR Group Studios in beautiful Columbus, Ohio. As we get rolling, I'd like to remind you what this podcast is about and how this whole Ask Joe Powder thing got started. The genesis of Joe Powder goes back about 16 years to a quarterly newsletter for a small powder manufacturer where I worked. Since then... The column has been regularly published in a number of formats, both at home and abroad, including print and online versions. Yeah, so the purpose of our podcast here is to just bring some news and technical know-how to the global powder coating community. Uh, before we get started, do you want to give another shout-out? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I'd like to give a shout-out to the cool cats at Diamond Vogel Powder Coatings. Specifically, Zach DeJong and Rich Etcherhoff. These guys are in the process of producing a new video on different cure temps and powder coatings. These guys know their stuff and are providing a valuable service to the industry. Look for details of their video on Zach's LinkedIn page. Again, that's Zach DeJong. D-E-J-O-N-G. All right, so what's new in the powder coating industry? All right, there's our, this is our guess what segment, people. If you recall, in our episode one podcast, we spoke about the new ruling by the European Union regarding health hazards associated with titanium dioxide. As we mentioned, the EU had classified respirable particles of TiO2 as Category 2 H351 carcinogen. H351 refers to an inhalation hazard. The reasoning for this ruling had to do with the aerodynamic diameter of the particles. Uh, And another part to this ruling was it wasn't just for pure TiO2, but the implication was any particles smaller than 10 microns that contain TiO2. Their rationale is that all of these particles are respirable and therefore an inhalation risk. Today, I'd like to give you an update and talk about potential mitigation options and also issues regarding labeling. As for innovation, it can go two ways. One would involve altering the manufacturing of powder coatings by eliminating all but 1% of the fines generated through minimizing their generation in the the grinding process, which is highly unlikely, or scalping them or removing them during the process, which we would suggest would be economically unfeasible. Another mitigation approach one could consider would be formulating with an alternative white opacifier, uh, something other than titanium dioxide. Historically, zinc sulfide and uh, 
lithopone, which is, is kind of a chemical combination of zinc sulfide and barium sulfate, have been used to make paint white. However, neither are very efficient and therefore not very economical. And really, if you go back a little further in time, the madcap paint chemists used to use highly toxic lead carbonate to make paint white, which is obviously a non-starter. There's one other issue, uh, and this this goes with the labeling, and what I what I would classify as sensory overload and indifference due to pervasive labeling. Most of us are familiar with the ever-cautious labeling engendered by the great state of California. Through their Proposition 65, they identify potentially carcinogenic compounds and then require labeling of products that contain these materials. The joke that ruminates across the U.S. is that there's such a vast number of products that have these labels that we really don't pay attention anymore and and we just, well, it's a good thing I don't live in California, otherwise this product might give me cancer. The problem here is if all all materials containing titanium dioxide have a label cautioning their carcinogeneity, then there'll be a, a point of sensory overload and we're just going to ignore those labels. We won't even notice them. Regardless of the outcome of this regulatory haggling, I have to tell you, it's always wise to handle all chemicals with caution and respect. At a minimum, ensure adequate ventilation in your powder manufacturing and application systems, and refer back to the measures that can be found in sections 7 and 8 of your product safety data sheet. In addition, please heed the particular recommendations that deal with personal protective equipment, a.k.a. PPE, which are detailed in the Section 8 of your SDS. In the meantime, we'll keep you posted regarding any new developments concerning the safe handling of TiO2 or any other materials associated with powder coatings. And our next piece of news has to do with an article in the Paint and Coatings Industry magazine. They're interviewing a company called InnovaCoat, and we were actually... Uh, first introduced to those guys when they did a presentation at the powder coating summit in Columbus, Ohio. They have a technology to reprocess waste powder coatings. Waste powder coatings from collected overspray, expired off spec, reclaimed spray to waste type of powder. They segregate the waste powder, clean, prepare, and reprocess it into custom color match products. And it's interesting stuff. The story can be found in PCI Magazine or at PCIMag.com. Another story from PCI Magazine has to do with bio-based materials in the coatings industry. This one's entitled, Soybean Oil Offers Performance and Sustainability, Coupled with Abundant and Affordable Supply. Soybean oil is one of those uh, most sustainable, biorenewable, abundant, and economic materials that can compete with petroleum-derived products. It's commercially abundantly available either as unrefined product or uh, what's called an RBD grade, or refined, bleached, deodorized grade. And, And basically, they derive primary unsaturated fatty acids, typically based on C18 polyunsaturates, and they convert these into intermediates for uh, various applications, including uh, resins and materials used in in coatings. Some of the chemical intermediates include acrylated epoxide soybean oil and, and various dye acids that can be used as curing agents, corrosion inhibitors, uh, waxes, and and to create specialty polyesters. They get their funding from the United Soybean Board, which is composed of 78 U.S. soybean farmers who have been appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture to invest soybean checkoff funds. These are 
kind of like a small tax that they put on each bushel of soybeans that are produced and sold. They've done all kinds of work, including alkids and latexes and impact modifiers, reactive diluents, soybean-based wax. But what's interesting to us is they've been involved with the development of powder coating resins. This work has been done by Battelle Memorial Institute, and they've come up with a licensable powder coating resin technology, which is said to be 84% bio-based, and it excels in a number of different performance areas, like it's, it's excellent for low temperature cure, which we're talking about somewhere about 135 Celsius. It also offers uh, excellent flexibility, toughness, chemical and corrosion resistance, and surprisingly, uh, outstanding outdoor weatherability. Uh, tests have shown powders based on this resin to uh, endure 4,000 hours of exposure in QUVB type accelerated exposure testing. And full disclosure on that, we've actually been working on the project with Patel. All right, our next segment is What Gets Me Mad? All right. What gets me mad? All right. What gets me mad, guys, is lead in paint. You think about it. Sometimes we have to think globally. In the developed industrial world of powder coatings, we've long since departed from the notion of using any heavy metal-based pigments. Nevertheless, it's hard to comprehend how developing nations face seemingly the simplest formulation issues with the industrial coatings that they produce. A recent trip to Kenya opened my eyes to a serious health and safety issue associated with lead-based paint. And what's the problem with lead-based paint? Well, exposure to lead occurs when paint flakes off of window frames, doors, playground equipment, and other consumer items. These lead-containing paint particles can then poison groundwater, soil, and the atmosphere. Eventually, lead is ingested by humans through food, drinking water, and the respiratory system. And even trace amounts of lead can cause serious health issues in in children and in adults, including cognitive impairment, loss of appetite, stunted growth, among all sorts of other issues. The other thing is, studies have shown that a high percentage of children in Africa have elevated lead levels in their blood. The economic impact of health impairment from lead exposure has been estimated to be nearly $135 billion. The cost for paint makers to switch to non-lead-based paints uh, in reality is minuscule in comparison to these health hazards. So therefore, we first world coating technologies need to gaze beyond our day-to-day existence and recognize the plight of our third world sisters and brothers. Indeed, the British Coatings Federation, the Canadian Paint and Coatings Association, Axo Nobel, the American Coatings Association, and most recently the Powder Coating Research Group have joined the Global Alliance to Eliminate Lead Paint. This is an initiative co-sponsored by the World Health Organization and the United States EPA. Perhaps it's time for you to consider lending a hand as well. All right, let's uh, take some questions and see what Joe Powder has to say. The first question comes from Wen in Vietnam. He says, Howdy, Joe. At present, we're dealing with a finished powder coating issue that we really need to seek your help. So let me describe the issue for you. We're powder coating our cabinets with black powder and experience that the surface side of the side cabinet is not equally black. It has a band of slightly white color on it instead. The root cause we suspect was due to the heat distribution differential because the part's thickness are different. The area where the part is 0.8 millimeters, the color looks just fine. However, the areas where the parts have additional reinforced plates, making the thickness higher, have slightly white bands. 
So I'd like to seek your professional support to help me with the solutions so we can solve this troublesome issue. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Ah, so Gwen, this is a case of when black is not always black. Well, thanks for your question. From what you described, this problem is associated with the cure of the powder coating. What I think is happening is the coating is experiencing much higher temperatures over the thin metal gauge areas and much lower temperature and less cure at the thicker sections of your parts. Furthermore, if your coating is a semi-gloss or matte type finish, degree of cure will most definitely affect the gloss of the finish. And with black coatings, differences in gloss will appear to be a different color. The reason behind this phenomenon is that it's very common for us powder formulators to use a differential cure mechanism to achieve a low gloss finish. Achieving a consistent gloss is therefore contingent upon fully curing the coating on all surfaces of your parts. Under cure will result in higher gloss than the fully cured areas and therefore create a difference in appearance. My advice to you, Gwen, is to measure the temperature of various sections of your parts and ensure that even the thickest areas achieve the part temperature and time specified by your powder supplier. You can find this in the technical data sheet that they supply. And if you're finding that you're seeing a significant difference in temperature, uh, what I'd recommend is you raise your oven temperature or leave your parts in the oven longer. Good luck, and I hope you have a pleasant day. Best regards, Joe. We're going to take a quick break to hear something from our sponsor. Gamma's newest Optiflex Pro model, the CF unit, offers simple, reliable color changes in 20 seconds. The Optiflex Pro CF unit is the perfect solution for lab use, powder quality testing, and coating of small quantities or small size samples. For more information, Call 877-437-6771. Once again, that's 877-437-6771. And be sure to mention, Ask Joe sent me. Thanks for that one, Joe. The next question comes to us from Dan in Memphis, Tennessee. He says... Hey Joe, we fabricate and install ornamental iron fence and we're having some finish issues. For years we used a wet paint system for our fence, but swapped over to all powder coat in the past couple years. We have a powder coat system, we're still working on making code enforcement happy before we can use it. For now we're outsourcing coating, but I'd like to know how to prevent this before we coat for ourselves. I read in one of your columns that discusses a Faraday cage effect, and it seems like this may be the same issue we're having, but I'm not so sure. The issue is coming from small space where the vertical picket goes through the punched channel runners. There's no coating in that tight space, and after a little time it starts to rust and it quickly turns into a mess. It's quite expensive when we have this problem, and I would like to find a way to resolve this issue so we don't have to spend days with a foam brush touching up all these rusted spots once the fence is installed. The fence may be a unique situation because it's installed by the time this issue shows up, so we can't simply just blast it and start over. Any advice you have would be greatly appreciated. Hey Dan, thanks for your question. And I can say from our experience, this is a very common problem associated with architectural steel fabrication. Talk about fences and gates and, and things of that nature. As the article you cited describes, the Faraday cage effect refers to an electrostatically dead area where two surfaces intersect, creating an inside corner. Charge accumulates everywhere except inside this corner. And that's what we call a Faraday cage. As you might imagine, the tighter the corner, the worse the effect. The boilerplate recommendations we can give you are, first of all, ensure that you have a good ground to earth. Also, reducing the current at the gun tip and using 
A slotted gun tip rather than a fan spray can help direct the powder into that corner. Furthermore, using one of the modern spray guns that are available from really all the application equipment companies, they have an automatic charge control that can eliminate this problem. Basically, these guns have a sensor which detects an excess charge buildup and it automatically cuts back the current to the gun and allows the powder to penetrate these Faraday cages. Another technique that you should consider is to preheat the part and then manually hit the tight corners while the part is still warm. Temperature of around 90 to 100 Celsius, kind of like 185 to 210 degrees Fahrenheit is a good temperature range. After you hit these tough corners, you can take your time applying the powder to the easier, more presentable surfaces of your of your parts. Sounds to me like you're in the midst of installing a powder application system in your own plant. The equipment you are about to commission probably has automatic charge control, which will minimize, if not eliminate, the coverage issue that you've been observing. Make sure that you explain to your equipment suppliers the intricacy of your parts and the need for complete coverage. They can help you with gun settings and even more so with programs for various application situations, including these tricky Faraday cages, recoats, and when you're trying to achieve thick film build. Good luck, Dan. Best regards, Joe Powder. Before we wrap up, let's fill you in on some upcoming events. All right, the Powder Coating Kitchen Short Course is now going to be June 16th through 17th in Columbus, Ohio. The CCAI Women in Finishing Forum is going to be in April 2021 now. Surface Finishing Mexico, rescheduled for March 8th through 10th, 2021. The American Coating Show is going to be canceled this year. The European Coating Show still happened in 2021, and then the next ACS is going to be in 2022. Middle East Show in Dubai is going to be September 7th through 9th, 2020. Coatings for Africa 2020 has been postponed till May 6th through 8th. And the Paint Expo in Germany is rescheduled for October 12th through 15th. And the Powder and Bulk Solids Conference and Exhibition is October 6th through 8th, 2020, outside of Chicago. Tune in next time when we tackle... Powder Technology for Coastal Regions in Southern California and Phantom Craters in Malta. You can find Joe Powder in Powder Coated Tough Magazine, PPCJ, Finishing Flash from PCI. You can find us on the web at askjoepowder.com. Send in your questions to askjoepowder at yahoo.com. Or our phone number is... Country code 1 4782 Ask Joe. Again, that's 1-478-227-5563. This has been a production of Powder Coating Research Group. Sound and music by Nick Page. You are what you is. You is what you ain't. And keep your powder dry. Thank you for listening to the Ask Joe Powder Podcast. This episode was brought to you by GEMA. Whether you're the shop manager, system engineer, or powder coder, once you decide to make GEMA an integral part of your shop, you'll understand how simple it is to be so productive. For a demonstration, call 877-437-6771. Once again, that's 877-437-6771. And be sure to mention, Ask Joe sent me. When you want to know that everything is covered, complete it with GEMA. You good? Let me know when you're good. 
Um, get my arms out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. On, talk to each other. Powder, Are you... powder, 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 powder. <laughs> Testing powder. Powder Joe, coating. Joe Powder. Joe Powder. Have you been recording for like an hour? Yeah, a few minutes.